listen to The Front on your smart speaker every morning. To hear the latest episode, just say, play the news from The Australian. From The Australian, here's what's on the front. I'm Claire Harvey. It's Monday, July 8. The Federal Court has convened a special panel of judges to tackle a wave of constitutional challenges engulfing the legal system in the wake of a landmark High Court decision that freed asylum seekers from indefinite detention, including some convicted of serious violent offending. That exclusive by Rhiannon Down is live now at theaustralian.com.au. A pro-Palestine organisation called The Muslim Vote, which helped five independent candidates win seats in the UK, will this week announce its candidates here in Australia. It's one of the many reasons Australia's politicians are anxiously analysing Britain's stunning election results which swept Labor to power and threw up a whole new set of challenges for the major parties. That's today's episode. American presidents get months to move into the White House. That means they also get months to move out when their term is over. Things move much faster in Britain. Sir Keir Starmer, Your Majesty. Your Majesty. As the UK's newly elected Prime Minister, Labour's Keir Starmer, shook hands with the King and engaged in a few moments of awkward chit chat. You must be absolutely exhausted your knees, but not much. He was already the new tenant at 10 Downing Street, and Rishi Sunak, with his wife and daughters, was out. As Labour absorbed its stunning majority, more than 410 seats out of the 650-seat House of Commons, there was a party. We did it! And then a sombre first speech. If I asked you now whether you believe that Britain will be better for your children, I know too many of you would say no. Keir Starmer has entered the House of Commons with a staggering majority the second biggest since the Second World War. Richard Ferguson is the Australian's National Chief of Staff. He could be Prime Minister for a decade. He's already thinking about the next election. But this is a majority that's on shaky ground. This is a majority that relied very heavily on people hating the Tories rather than loving Labour. They're calling this the loveless landslide. Starmer has spent four years rebuilding Labor's lost soul after it was thrashed by the Tories in 2019, surrounded by a cloud of distaste about the anti-Semitism former leader Jeremy Corbyn had allowed to flourish within the party. Starmer sacked Corbyn from Labor altogether, the first step in a reset where Starmer proved himself politically ruthless. My government will fight every day until you believe again. From now on, you have a government unburdened by doctrine, guided only by the determination to serve your interest, to defy quietly those who have written our country off. Starmer and his wife have two teenagers, a boy and a girl. But until now, their names have been kept secret at the request of the Starmers, respected by the UK press. Victoria Starmer has Jewish heritage, and Starmer has previously revealed their children have been raised in the traditions of that faith. It was reported in the days after the election that the kids didn't want to leave their home in London's inner suburbs. However, it's expected they will move into Downing Street, the row of 17th century townhouses, with offices on the ground floor and living quarters above. Margaret Thatcher called it living over the shop. The Starmers are still unpacking, but they'll move into the interconnected living quarters above number 11 Downing Street, where there are four bedrooms, rather than the much smaller two-bedroom flat above number 10. Starmer is already indicating he'll be different. He said throughout his career he has finished work at 6pm on Fridays, while working as a chief prosecutor and as a human rights barrister, 
and he says he has no intention of changing that habit. In many ways, Keir Starmer is the opposite of now a few prime ministers ago, Boris Johnson, and that we don't know anything about him really at all. With Boris Johnson, we obviously knew every affair, every illicit detail, even if he wouldn't tell us how many kids he had. We knew there were at least a couple that he wasn't admitting about. But with Keir Starmer, you know, we know his wife, Victoria, works in the NHS, the National Health Service. We know that they've got a number of children, but we, we don't know their names. We don't know what they look like. He's also different than, say, Tony Blair and Margaret Thatcher, whose children were very much a part of their lives and of their prime ministerships and were out there and used kind of as political props sometimes with the Starmer family. It's all very, very private. It's all very much business up front. Starmer says the children have asked to get a dog and there's already a cat in residence at Downing Street, a rescue named Larry, who's lived there for 13 years. Keir Starmer will be Larry's sixth prime minister. Even though Labor only got 34% of the vote, it's getting more than 64% of the seats. That's because of Britain's voting system. First past the post means the person in each constituency who wins the greatest number of votes gets the seat. That's a stark difference from Australia, where the major parties often have to rely on preferences flowing from smaller parties. What Labour did and what the Liberal Democrats who came number three in the elections did very well is they played the first past the post game. So instead of focusing on national vote share, they poured all of their resources into the seats they knew that they could win a plurality of votes in, particularly for Labour. It was in Scotland, so they were really boosted by a huge sweep against the Scottish nationalists who have been very dominant in Scotland for the past decade. But Labour has swept all those seats in Glasgow and Edinburgh back. And the Liberal Democrats only had a very tiny national vote share increase too. But they had massive increases in the seats that they targeted in kind of affluent Tory areas, a little bit like the Teals here, that they knew they would get the votes in. They didn't have a formal deal, Labour and the Liberal Democrats, but Labour basically ran dead in seats where the Liberal Democrats would do well against the Tories and the Liberal Democrats ran dead in the seats where they knew that Labour were the best challenger of the Tories. Downing Street's previous tenant, Rishi Sunak, couldn't hide the pain as he fronted up for the Conservatives' blunders in front of that famous black door. I would like to say first and foremost, I am sorry. It was the biggest collapse in the Tory vote ever. And I think Rishi Sunak's position was irretrievable the minute he walked into number 10 Downing Street, Clare, because of Liz Truss. So Liz Truss obviously was the Prime Minister for only seven weeks. She was the Queen's last Prime Minister. But she only lasted seven weeks because of a disastrous mini-budget which sought, you know, a kind of a radical laissez-faire agenda. But what she did in that instance was she spooked the markets, but then she tied the Conservatives to a massive rise in interest rates. And the minute any political party is tied to the rising of interest rates, Claire, no matter where you are in the world, that is very bad news. The Tories lost more than 250 seats to sit at 121 seats out of 650. The Conservative Party's worst result in its entire 190-year history. Keir Starmer says it's down to business. He's promising to put the VAT, Britain's equivalent of a GST, on private school fees and to fix the creaking National Health Service, as well as a prisons crisis. Britain's jails are full and offenders are being released after serving half their terms to make room for more. And then there's unauthorised migration. So far this year, more than 13,000 migrants have arrived in the UK via small boats across the English Channel. The Tories wanted to send them to Rwanda in a fix inspired by John Howard's Pacific Solution. But Keir Starmer says that's off. Look, the Rwanda scheme was dead and buried before it started. It's never been a deterrent. Look at the numbers that have come over in the first six and a bit months of this year. They're record numbers, and I'm not prepared to continue with gimmicks that don't act as a deterrent. This is one of the things about Labour that they're going to really struggle with. 
they really didn't reveal what they were going to do at all in any area of policy, Claire, because they didn't want to spook the electorate. But he doesn't have a particularly strong plan to deal with a small boats crisis, and he's going to have to come up with one. And even Tony Blair is in the Times this weekend saying, if you don't control your borders, that's when prejudice flows. So he's having, the minute he's walked in, he's having Tony Blair, who it must be said, still holds the record for the biggest Labour majority, saying you must stop these small boats or it will be your undoing. One of the biggest factors Keir Starmer has to face now is the Gaza effect. Five independents, including Jeremy Corbyn, who campaigned hard on recognition of Palestine, took seats that Labour would otherwise have expected to win. It's a big problem, and it's a problem around the world. I mean, look at the primaries for the Democrats, where Joe Biden basically ran unopposed, but he suffered huge protest votes in places like Michigan with huge Muslim populations. Labour kind of saw this coming in Britain because they had huge protest votes in the council elections. And a lot of this has been directed by a group called the Muslim Vote. And as we know, they are looking to replicate that here in Australia, targeting some ministers such as the Education Minister Jason Clare, the Workplace Relations Minister Tony Bark. And we know that through Dennis Shanahan and Sarah Eisen's reporting in The Australian last week, that Anthony Albanese is concerned about this group. So we may yet see that replicated here, but it is definitely a problem for Keir Starmer. Coming up, the firebrand conservative everyone's talking about and how he could reshape British politics. The Australians' deep in coverage of the other two AUKUS elections happening in coming months, in the US and possibly here in Australia. You can be the smartest person in every room by joining our subscribers now at theaustralian.com.au and we'll be back after this break. One of the wild cards in the UK election is Nigel Farage, a politician who's been around UK politics for decades, initially as an anti-Europe campaigner and now offering himself as an alternative voice to the Tories with a strident line on migrants. His party was the second most popular in more than 100 seats and took a whopping 14% of the national vote. It also won five seats of its own, putting Farage into Parliament for the first time. There was one political analyst in Britain who said, Nigel Farage will be happy he's finally entered Parliament. He'll just be sad that there's four other MPs going with him. He has a reputation for falling out with people that have joined his group. For example, when he was in UKIP and a couple of Tories defected to UKIP, his original party, where she was pushing the Brexit vote from, he fell out with them. He's very much the star of his own show, but also... He actually has to be an MP. And the thing about being an MP, Claire, especially in Britain, even more than so in Australia, it's very restrictive. He can't dominate question time. He only gets one question maybe a couple of months. And then he, there's so much work an MP has to do, especially in Britain, where people write in about their council bins and the bus stop nearby making too much <laughs> noise and, oh, you know, there's a problem with my toilet and um, sewerage. Like... It is not going to be as glamorous as he thinks. And he may be wishing that he decided to go and do what he was originally going to do, which is go and stump around the country for Donald Trump and go to all these glitzy events for the Republicans in America, rather than be sucking in the, the seaside town of Clacton. Nigel Farage was criticised during the campaign for being allegedly pro-Russia. He's fired back about that, speaking here to our colleagues at Times Radio. I've never said mm. anything nice about Putin. I think what he's done in Ukraine is absolutely reprehensible at every level. Of course, all wars end in one of two ways, either annihilation or negotiation. I would have thought negotiation was rather important. I would have thought the West could say to Putin, oh, you've got to give up the territory uh, that you, you know thus far. Uh, and if you don't, uh, then I'm afraid uh, you know, we are going to lay down some very, very tough conditions and, and maybe NATO will have to expand. 
But Richard, he's now a force in the parliament who I think it's fair to say is not likely to support huge amounts of weaponry being sent to Ukraine to prolong the war. Is that your reading of this? And what does it mean for Ukraine and the rest of the world? I think ultimately it won't matter because Labour has five years. It's a much longer term than we have in Australia and they have such a huge majority. But what it will mean is if, say, there are other events in NATO in the next coming years, how will the Tory party react to how Nigel Farage thinks? This will be the problem for the British right. Do they welcome Nigel Farage back into the fold and try and get him into the Conservatives? Or do they try and push him out? Or hope that he blows himself up or gets bored? Labour has won the the first-past-the-post game, but it's on a very, very shaky ground, this majority. The Conservative Party is in a very, very bad place, but it's not impossible to imagine them even getting back to a kind of a hung parliament standing, maybe not in the next term, but definitely in the term after. So that is how it will affect, is how will the Conservatives react to Nigel Farage and what role will he play in the reorganisation of the British right? Richard Ferguson is The Australian's National Chief of Staff. Thanks for joining us on The Front. And don't forget to subscribe at theaustralian.com.au.